Hello, and welcome to our video on gender and representation. Our EU-funded project has the objective of challenging and transforming gender roles and identities linked to professional careers and working towards real institutional change. So why is gender balance representation an important element of this work? In recent years, a lot of work has been done at national and European level to increase the representation of women at senior levels on governing bodies, corporate boards and other positions of seniority and leadership. Some EU countries, for example, have introduced quotas in some circumstances, such as a compulsory percentage of women as board members. For example, in 2011, a 40% quota was introduced in France for companies with more than 500 employees or revenues over 50 million euros. However, the practice of using quotas is often debated and sometimes contested. In the UK, for example, quotas were rejected and a voluntary target approach adopted instead. In 2010, the Davies Review set a voluntary target of 25% women's representation on FTSE 100 companies, to be achieved by 2015. This target was reached and then extended by the Hampton Alexander Review, which sought to achieve at least 33% of women on the boards of FTSE 350 by 2020. Most FTSE companies now meet or exceed this target, however across Europe, binding measures have been more effective at increasing representation than soft recommendations. More recently, concerns have been focused on ethnic diversity and a lack of people from different ethnic backgrounds in senior positions, which does not reflect society in a realistic way. The Park Review, published in the UK in 2017, focused on ethnic inclusion. Having identified that over 50% of the FTSE 100 had no ethnic minority representation on their boards, the review set a target for all FTSE 100 boards to have at least one director from an ethnic minority background by 2021. By March 2021, over 80% of FTSE 100 companies had minority ethnic representation. Though there is a lot of research around gender balance in corporate settings and a growing amount on ethnic inclusion, there is less that considers intersectionality and the complex, cumulative way that the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism or sexism, combine, overlap or intersect. This applies especially to the experiences of marginalised individuals or groups. The Parker Report, for example, conducted only a very small amount of intersectional analysis showing that across the FTSE 100 in 2017, 42% of directors from ethnic minorities were women. So why do people believe representation is important? What benefits does it bring? We are going to consider five key arguments for representation. Descriptive representation is about visibility, where those who lead, govern or in the public eye reflect the people they represent perhaps in their experiences or some other characteristics such as gender or ethnic group. Where representatives resemble the population, it can increase that group's legitimacy and change perceptions about who can hold positions of authority. Research carried out with schoolgirls by Paul and Yellen, however, challenges the view that inspirational role models can necessarily be transformational or enable aspirations of leadership. They argue that the ways young women engage with those in the public eye can be complex, and focusing on visibility and gender is not enough. They point to the blurring of lines between being a celebrity and being a leader, which can open up all kinds of questions about the right kind of role model, showing that increasing representation may not always have the outcomes we plan. Representation is not only about visibility. Representation can also bring about substantive transformations and advance the interests of underrepresented groups, since individuals with shared experiences or history can present the group's ideas or viewpoint and advocate on their behalf. This feeds into a moral or social justice case for representation, based on the principles of equality, dignity, respect, the fair distribution of power, resources and opportunities, and women's right to participate as decision makers. The moral case for gender diversity also emphasises an integrated relationship between the individual, business and society, which forms the core argument of corporate social responsibility. A case which is often used for increasing the number of women in leadership positions is that they can bring something extra. Through alternative perspectives, networks, personalities, leadership styles and skill sets. Some highlight the benefits of stereotypically feminine characteristics, such as being questioning, empathetic, intellectually honest or having good listening skills. However, these arguments can contribute to essentialist perspectives on women and men's inherent skills and characteristics, 
underplaying the fact that differences, if any, are largely the product of different patterns of socialisation. Some research has shown that women bringing different skill sets creates a mixed power model that has a positive impact on profitability and shareholder value. In this way, support and justification for gender balanced representation is often justified by meritocratic arguments based on a business case perspective, which suggests that increased women's representation ultimately improves company performance. Reports from consulting firm McKinsey & Co argue that companies with higher numbers of women on executive teams are significantly more likely to outperform those with fewer or no women, although this report cannot confirm whether there is a causal relationship here and some studies suggest either no effect or negative effect of board gender balance on financial performance. Relying simply on a financial case for increasing numbers of women in leadership positions can, therefore, be vulnerable. There are then a number of convincing arguments for more balanced representation as a way of achieving positive change. But, from the perspective of individuals, we can increase their chances and help them to accumulate social capital, for example, through networking initiatives, human capital, perhaps through targeted training programmes, and relational capital through mentoring and sponsorship. At a societal and institutional level, there are different types of positive action that can help to achieve these aims, including increasing the potential pool of diverse individuals through outreach or engagement activities to connect with underrepresented groups, targets which can make a crucial critical mass happen more quickly, and reviewing institutional structures which may be creating barriers such as recruitment or promotion procedures in order to eliminate potential bias. To conclude, though there is an increasing amount of attention on the representation of gender and people from different ethnic backgrounds, there is less knowledge on where these intersect with one another or on other diverse groups that include people's sexual orientation or disability. We hope that this will be the next stage in the evolution of understanding representation. Thank you very much for listening.